Good evening. So glad to be with you this evening on this wonderful Lord's Day. I come to you on behalf of the members and the leadership of New Life Ministries Church in Plato, Missouri. And I come to you in the name of the Lord to share with you his precious word that I believe will not only inspire your, your life, but also will strengthen you and will bring glory to his name in your life. You realize the blessings that come along with his word if we trust in him. Before we go any further, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, that you are God all by yourself. There is no other God but you. You're the true, the living God. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. We thank you for your word. For your word is spirit and your word is life. And we do not live by bread alone. We confess that. But we live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay, that I would be an oracle of your word and of your will to these, your people, and that the eyes of their understanding will be open and they will receive revelation knowledge from you, and they will walk upright before you and please you in all their ways, so that you will be glorified in every aspect of their life. We thank you, Father, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to uh, be coming to you from the Epistle of James. And we're going to be in the first chapter of the Epistle of James. And we're going to start at the first verse. But as you can see, our subject, the testing time the testing time. We are living in a time, kind of we could say in a lot of ways, it's an unprecedented time. As people will say, well, the world is evil. The world has always been evil ever since the Garden of Eden. So that's nothing new. You say people are um, are killing one another. Crime is on the increase. Crime has always been on the increase where there is no respect for the, the standards that God has laid down in for society. When a society abandons the standards that God has laid down for um, acceptable living, we're left with chaos. We're left with the breakdown of the family. We're left with the breakdown of institutions and standards. But why is this such an unprecedented time? It's an unprecedented time in that we live in a day and age where uh, ignorance is something that is validated that is worshipped, that is uh, celebrated. And when you say, well, what do you mean? I mean this. In days of old, even in ancient times, we find that uh, the majority of people, even those that did not live right, that were evil, they believed in something greater than themselves. They believed in God, a God. They might not have recognized the true and the living God, but they believed in a God. But we live in a time and a day when belief in nothing is what is celebrated. Belief in no one is what is appreciated. We live in a time and a day where if there be uh, one that would get uh, the allegiance or the adherence uh, or respect uh, that God used to get, it would be our governments. We, we worship the government. We look to the government to supply our needs and to do things for us. In other words, we look to ourselves. Self is the God that's on the throne of our hearts. And because of that, 
because we do not recognize the living God, the true God, the creator of all things. Uh, we are left with only one option, and that is foolishness. And we see foolishness reign supreme all around us. But having said all of that, we are faced with a, a time that is challenging. It's a, it's, it's a time filled with challenges uh, to, uh, to each and every one of us. Uh, challenges on the job, challenges in school, challenges in government, challenges uh, even in our homes. We're left with that. We're faced with that. We're faced with so many uncertainties because the rules have been changed. They've been moved out of the way. The standards have been moved out of the way. And so uh, everything has become relevant. In other words, you have people, you hear people say, uh, what's true for you might not necessarily be true for me. What's uh, good for you might not necessarily be good for me. What's right for you might not necessarily be my right. That's all relevance. Well, that's chaos because there has to be an absolute in order for there to be order. Without an absolute, there is no order. You have to have something that you can measure against that is stationary, that's stabilized, that is foundational, that you can measure against in order for you to have order. And so we live in a world that is... Uh, it seems like everything is out of control, but I want to tell you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you should know that everything is not out of control because God still has it all in control. The uh, Before we get into the first chapter of James, I want you to go with me very quickly to the book of Psalms. The question was asked there. Uh, in the in the book of Psalms, um, let's look at. Psalms Psalms 11 and 3 ask the question if the foundation let's 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 go up further than that let's go to uh, the first verse to the chief musician a psalm of David uh, David makes a declaration here but you could you could almost see him in this day and age uh, dealing with what we have dealt with. He says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? In other words, he's saying that I put my trust in God, and yet there are others around me that tell me, Go hide. Go find your safe place. Get your safe area, your safe place. It says, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. There, when you make, it, uh, make up in your mind that you're going to live right and you're going to walk upright and you're going to do what is right in God's eyes, understand you become a target. You become a target of the enemy. You become a target of Satan. And all of those who are following his desires and following his will, um, and they asked the question, he asked the question, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is where we are. If the foundations be destroyed, what are we going to be able to do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord tried the righteous. And this, this word tried testing. But the wicked and him that loved violence, his soul hateth. But on the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord, 
For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doeth both doeth behold rather the upright. Okay. So uh Having looked at this, and as you can see, I've got this uh, uh, un right under the uh, um, the subject, the testing time. I have, please do not disturb, we're testing. So we're going to talk about the testing that we're going through. This is the testing time. We are going through a test, saints of God. We are being tried in the fire. James is speaking here in the first verse. He says, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered among the nations. Greetings. This was primarily written to the Jews. However, it was not just for the Jews because along with the Jews, Christ has brought us in who were not a people. He has brought us in so that there be one people in one house. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, various testing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, if I was to take this uh, on a personal note uh, in the in the uh, the natural realm, um, the only test that I can remember kind of looking forward to was uh, my driver's test. Uh, when I was look, going to uh, test for my driver's license uh, or the testing that I that I was pretty confident that I could pass. Now, if it was a test that I wasn't sure I could pass, I was not, it was no joy in that. I didn't count it joy. And so in the natural realm, all of the testing that we have experienced or that we might have, have uh, been exposed to has been a test to, uh, to fail or to pass pass or fail. That's been the testing that we have experienced. However, with God, God doesn't test you for passing or failing because he already knows what you're going to do. He knows what is in you and he knows what you are capable of. God already knows if you're going to pass a test or if you're going to fail. He already knows this. And so when we look at this from the standpoint of of how God tests, God tests from a standpoint of maturing you, from a standpoint of bringing out in you what is best and those things that are not best, that are not good for you, he brings those out too for them to be discarded. God exposes them so that you can, uh, they can be taken out of your life. He does not test you to pass or fail, because he already has declared you to be a success. He's already declared you, if you're his, if you're a child of God, he has already put his seal of approval upon you. And Paul says it this way, the foundation, remember the question over in, in Psalms 11, if the foundation be destroyed, what can a righteous do? Well, Paul says the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth those that are his. So God already knows who belongs to him. And he already knows the end result of those that belong to him. He knows that you will be made perfect. Just men, Hebrews said, the, the, this, uh, uh, just men made perfect. Uh, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith is not meant to produce failure. It's not meant to produce um, destruction. It's not meant to produce depression. It's not meant to produce hopelessness and helplessness. But the testing of your faith is meant to do the opposite, to build you up. To, to, to enable you to endure unto the end so that you will be saved. But let the endurance have its perfect work. Faith produces endurance, but it doesn't produce endurance just for endurance sake, but endurance has a work to do in you. 
Faith is going to bring out endurance in you so that you can complete what endurance is supposed to do in you. And that is that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. God wants us to understand that with him being on board in our lives, he wants us to understand with him being on board through the trials. He wants us to understand with him being on board through the challenges of life that we have the victory. Paul says it another way in Romans 8 chapter. We are made more than conquerors through Christ that strengthens us. David picked the same thing up and looked at it from a different perspective, but it comes to the same conclusion. When he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my roha, my feeder, the one that, that, that feeds me, that nourishes me. I will not lack anything. Well, how does he do this? Through the faith that I have in him, through the testing, through the fire, through the trial, he brings me to maturity and produces perfection in me, making me complete. The word salvation, the Greek word salvation in the New Testament, sozo, means to be made whole or to be made complete. So lacking nothing, so that I don't fall behind in any capacity. Even though in the physical, it might seem as if I have fallen behind or fallen short. Because of God's declaration of who I am in him, I will ultimately meet the goal. I will ultimately fulfill the purpose. I will ultimately fulfill my destiny. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it shall be given to him. If you're in a test and you want to know how to make it through the test, ask God to help you. Ask of him, Lord, what am I supposed to see in this test? What am I supposed to see in this challenge? What am I supposed to learn from that's going to make me better in this particular um, trial and tribulation? And God will willingly give you the answer who gives to all generously and without reproach and it shall be given him god doesn't when you ask god to to give you wisdom you ask god for the truth god doesn't turn around and say uh uh bite your head off and say uh why are you asking me what do you want that for or anything like that and he does not uh, hold that against you because you're asking for help, because you're asking for deliverance, because you're asking for wisdom. He does not hold that against you. When you admit that you do not know, God does not hold that against you. Sometimes people in this in this realm, the natural realm, if you ask a question, they look upon look at you as if you're stupid, and that is something that that you should know. You're asking me, you should already know this. God doesn't do that. God lovingly and cheerfully and joyfully uh, gives you the answer that you need. All you have to do is ask the question. But let him ask in faith, doubting nothing. For he that doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. When you ask God for anything when you're in the test, you must believe that he is going to give you the answer. You can't doubt. You can't ask him saying, well, I don't know if he's going to answer me. I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, I'm asking, but I'm not really sure that he's going to answer me. No, that's not the attitude to have. You should have an attitude of knowing that God is faithful and true to his word. The writer of Hebrews tells us that if any man comes to God, he must first believe that he is, this is the 11th chapter of Hebrews, that he is and that he is a rewarder unto those that diligently seek him, that sincerely seek him, that consistently seek him. For let not that man suppose that he shall receive anything from the Lord. In other words, that man that doubts, that man that questions uh, whether God is going to answer, whether God is going to respond. If you go in with that attitude, you know, you're not going to receive anything. And sometimes we use that as an excuse for giving up on God because we say, well, I wasn't expecting anything and I didn't get anything. Well, that's why you didn't get anything, because you did not expect. You did not ask in faith. But when you ask God, 
to heal you, believing that he will heal you. And you trust him that he will do what is right and he will choose the way of healing. Whichever way he chooses to heal you, when you trust him, he will do it. When you go to him, believing that he will give you the wisdom in how to navigate the challenges of life or, or the navigate the, uh, uh, the problems that are in your life, he will give it to you. If you go to him, believing that he's going to do this, you will receive the answer. Verse 8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Why? Because he has left off the standards of God's faith. He does not use God's standards of faith in order to approach God. He uses his own standard, hoping and groping, hitting and missing, thinking that through much talk and much words, one of them is going to stick and God's going to respond. No, you go understanding that God wants to help you. God is your helper. Let the lowly brother rejoice in his exaltation. In other words, when God promotes you and God brings you out of that low estate and brings you to a higher estate, Rejoice, praise him, glorify him, give him honor and glory, worship him. But the rich man in his humiliation, in other words, uh, if you're rich and God puts a governor on you, God holds you back in some areas or whatever, be thankful, be grateful, rejoice. Because God has you in his, in his control. And the reason you should rejoice is because he's looking out for you. He does not want you to get ahead of yourself and get so caught up in your riches and in the things that you have, the abilities that you have. You might be rich in ability, rich in talents, um, rich in a lot of things. But we get so caught up in those things that we overlook or we neglect the giver of those things. No, rejoice. If God put an, uh, a, a governor on you, Paul said it this way when he was talking about the thorn in the flesh. He said that lest I should be exalted above measure because of the re abundance of the revelations. God, Paul received some revelations that others did not receive. Paul saw some things that others were not able to see into, into the depths that he saw. Them. But because of that God put a governor on Paul. God allowed some things on Paul to keep Paul from getting big headed. And sometimes he does that with us. He allows things to happen to us to keep us in check. Because let me tell you something, without the discipline of God, without the, the uh, chastisement of God and him keeping us under control, we would get the big head in a, in a hurry and get too proud in ourselves and we'll forget about God. And we will say, my own hand has done this for me. My own thinking has brought this to me, which is pride. And pride goes before a fall. But the rich man in his humiliation, because like a flower of the field, he will pass away. For the sun arose with burning heat and withered the grass and his flower fell off and his beautiful appearance perished. So the rich man also shall fade away in his pursuits. In other words, if that's where you put your faith, if your faith is in the things that you have acquired or attained, in the, your faith is in the, uh, uh, the positions and the titles and all these things, you're going to leave that stuff behind. There is coming a day and a time you will close your eyes for the last time on this side of of, of uh, death and when you awake on the other side of death you won't have those things you won't have your money you won't have your houses you won't have your cars you won't have your clothes and your possessions you won't even have some relationships on the other side they're gonna perish so put your faith in that which lasts let your, Jesus said it this way, let your treasure be in heaven above where neither thieves nor moth or rust corrupts. Let your treasure be there. Another way he said it in Matthew, the sixth chapter in the 33rd verse, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added to you. They'll be added to you 
in due time, in due season, and they will be added to you in a way that they will not become a stumbling block to you. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, because when he is approved, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God has a purpose for you. God has a destiny for you. And he wants you to come forth as pure gold. That's why you have the testing. Ore has to be tested. It has to be tried in the fire. That's a testing. And when it's when it's all, all the dross is, is moved off the top and all of the, the, the uh, impurities are moved out of the way and then the pure gold is left and that's what that's what put in one side and the rest is thrown away into the slag heap. God is wanting to make you into pure gold. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God does not set you up. You that belong to him, you that are seeking his face and trying to do what is right, God has never set you up to fail. God has never set you up to mess up. God is always working to bring you into the greater good. God is always working to bring you into that place where you will be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not making a better you. God is making another Christ in you. He is making you, shaping you. The Holy Spirit is designing you after the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the standard. He is our example. But each one is tempted by his own lust, being drawn away and being seduced by them. When lust, then lust, when it conceives, brings, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The temptation, your, your, let me put it this way, your desire matched with the temptation when they come together. Now you can be, you can have a desire, and temptation comes. Well, when your desire agrees or embraces that temptation, then the result of that is conception, and the baby that comes out of that is sin. And when sin grows up, it's gonna kill you. It brings forth death. Imagine a baby being born with a forty-five in his hand, pointed at your head. That's basically what sin is as a result of you yielding to temptation. And all of us have yielded to temptation, all of us, because of our desire. If you don't desire something, you can't be tempted. But understand this. Notice what he says. Uh, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. In other words, he goes through it. He doesn't yield to it. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. The devil can't give you a good gift. He definitely can't give you a perfect gift. And no one else can give you a good gift or a perfect gift except God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God doesn't change his mind. The gifts and calling of the Lord are without repentance. Repentance is a changing of the mind. And I know you might reach back and say, well, God repented of this or repented of that. It's, he didn't change his mind. What he did was change his action. He changed in the way that he was uh, 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 dealing or interacting with a particular person or nation or object. But in him, there is no variation. He's solid. He's foundational. A shadow of turning. There's not even a hint of him failing. He is faithful. He is faithful. The psalmist said in another place, I believe it's Psalm 19, says, the, says the, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Exercising his will, he begat us by the word of truth. In other words, God made the choice. It was his will for us to be born again, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You 
are going through the testing. The proto you're the prototype. You're being tested, vetted, so that you will be ready, made ready for the new heaven and the new earth that he has got um, purposed. So then, my beloved brothers, let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's why you have two ears and one mouth. If you exercise your ears more than you do your mouth, you won't be angry so quickly. And you won't mess up so much. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and abundance of evil in meekness. Now notice it says laying aside. That means that's an action. That's something that you do. You make a choice. You pick it up just like you lay aside a coat or lay aside a package. You move it out of the way. That's what he's saying. Move all filthiness and abundance of evil out of your way. But do it in meekness, receiving the implanted word, which I'm preaching to you right now, which is able to save your soul. Every time I read this, I think about what that old preacher said to me. It's actually a uh, bishop of mine that said to to all of us but he said this to me in particular he said if you believe the word of god god's word is so powerful that if you believe it it'll save your soul and that's truth god's word is so powerful that if you believe it it'll save your soul but become doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves if you hear the word apply it Take it. Make up in your mind, I'm going to do what I have heard preached to me. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observed himself and has gone away and immediately forgot what sort of man he was. You know, forgot the image that was in the mirror. And that's what happens. We forget what was preached to us if we don't apply it to our lives. If we don't make up in our minds when we hear it, if we don't say, yes, Lord, I'm going to do that. And we set our, our minds to do that and our wills to do that. Uh, we will forget. But, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, talking about the word of God and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. And that's woman too. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceiving his heart, the religion of this man is useless. In other words, listen more, do more, and talk less. And this right here is strictly is really applying to those that are gossipers. You like to talk about other people. If you want to talk about anybody, talk about yourself. I'm talking about bad. If you're going to point out the bad things in anybody, point out the bad things in yourself. Point out your failures and your faults before God. Confess your faults before God so that he can heal you of your faults. Peer an undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's your responsibility. That's the testing. We're in a testing time and we're being tested. And I'm going to say this to you as I close. We are right now in that place of the wheat and the tares. They're sifting right now. They're sifting right now. And either you're going to bear fruit of wheat and grain to the Lord to be used and be put in his barns, or you're going to be a tare and going to bear those tares, and he's going to burn it up, put it in the fire to be burned up and destroyed. It's your choice in the testing time. What do you want God to do with your test? 
Father, we confess we're in the testing time. We confess that there are challenges that we face that many of us have never faced before. But nothing is new to you. Nothing is surprising to you. You are never caught off guard. You're never amazed. We might be, but you're not. For you know the way that we take. And you know how to bring us through. You know how to deliver the godly out of temptation and out of tribulation. We put our trust and our hope in you. We look to you, Lord, to deliver us. And not only us, but deliver our nation. Deliver your people all over the world. Let them know your presence. For in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And we glorify you. And we bless you. And we praise you. We thank you for who you are. And what you have done. What you are doing. And what you're going to do. Help us to do what's right. Give us wisdom, Father. We ask you for wisdom. The wisdom to walk upright before you. Pleasing in your sight. And glorifying your name so that others might see you expressed in our lives and through our lives. And they will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for you are worthy of it all. Thank you, Lord. We confess that we were created by you and we were made for your pleasure. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. God bless you, saints. Until next time, go with God.